Hi, I'm Dr. Barbara Byers, and this morning I'm going to talk about dread, <clears throat> the dreaded word, dread. Psychologists define it as anticipatory anxiety. I think that's a great definition. Dread does anticipate. It looks for, it waits for, it's poised for something bad, something negative to happen. And this is just a mindset that's constantly with us when we live in dread. We settle on it and we're always anticipating the future in a heavy negative way. Uh, anxiety um, accompanies dread and anxiety really is an angst or an unease, an unease of heart, apprehension. So apprehension about what's to come, really it's kind of the, we're waiting for the other shoe to drop. And often this can just be a vague sense, like a looming cloudy sense uh, within us. So it's a foreboding. It clutches at us with fear. It constantly says, you know, there's going to be a negative contribution to our future. And it makes us live imprisoned and often in a kind of um, indecision because we're imagining a future apart from the goodness of God. Ooh, there's not much freedom to be open, to be at peace, to be creative because it's rooted in what's not true and not stable. We have an inaccurate assessment of life and, and of ourselves. Often, uh, anxiety, dread has its early roots in our childhood in lack of attachment to mother, to father, to stable, loving uh, parental figures. And it leaves us without a deep sense of well-being. Uh, but as we mature, we learn how to turn to the Lord and get our well-being from Him. And He invites us to come into His presence and, sh and share everything we feel. Um, and when we do that, we can make that exchange for his goodness. You know, the world is really desperate for people who have quiet inside. Not a quiet mouth, but a quietness of heart inside. And as we stay with the Lord, as we seek him, as we exchange our dread and our anxiety for his peace, we can walk in that kind of quiet. Well, what does dread do to our bodies? Because it certainly has an effect, our bodies and our minds. Um, when you look at fear, fear can be a very helpful tool. You know, a bear's coming out of the woods and I, I have this shot of adrenaline out of the fear and I run and that's hopefully helpful to get away. But the brain doesn't distinguish between fear and anxiety slash dread. It doesn't distinguish. So unfortunately, it, it reads them the same. It reads them both as a perceived threat. So our brain is wired to respond to any perceived threat by kicking on the sympathetic nervous system. And what happens is there's a sudden release of hormones into our system, uh, cortisol and adrenaline that help us uh, temporarily. So cortisol is a primary stress hormone and that kicks in sugar, that kicks in the glucose and it gives us real quick strength. But we don't want it on all the time and unfortunately when we have uh, anxiety and dread, it keeps it turned on all the time. So we're releasing these hormones slowly into our system and over a long time period, they will damage our internal organs. So the body just stays in a constant state of alert then. So to keep our body operating at a, a high level like that is draining and often we'll have kind of a chronic exhaustion or fatigue. Um, and you know, it also releases other involuntary responses in the body. We'll have uh, maybe rapid heart rate, we may have palpitations, we may have chest pains, breathing problems, headaches, nausea, sleep issues, respiratory, gra gastrointestinal, immune system issues chronic muscle tension, pain, weight gain, kind of a long, hard list there of what dread can chronically do to our bodies. We may even be at greater risk for high blood pressure and heart disease. So it's like these frequent distress signals are constantly being sent to your body to prepare a stress response. 
that's not even necessary and our muscles will contract, uh, contract and tighten and then over time they can become stiff and cramped and that pain can spread throughout the whole body and we don't even really know why it's there. Well, it's, it's dread. Um, then we get arthritis and fibromyalgia and all those kind of things. And then, so that's the body. What happens in the mind? Well, uh, dread, anxiety can actually create short-term memory problems, a kind of a brain fog and depression. And we, we tend to swing between depression and anxiety. One is high energy. Anxiety is high energy. I'm on depression is low energy. I'm depressed. And they're just two different states of energy, but they're connected by a common cycle of fear and feelings of hopelessness and helplessness and uh, frustration, dejection, and so on. And the fear, a dread is so debilitating because it keeps us in a constant state of apprehension. Like I said before, when's the other shoe gonna drop? Uh, the Lord tells us in Romans 15, 13, he wants our lives to abound in hope, not hopelessness. He wants us to anticipate his goodness, not to anticipate the negative, which drains our hope and drains our positive energy. Psalm 139, 23, at the end of Psalm 139, he says, search me and know my heart, test me and know my anxious thoughts. The Hebrew word, is disquieting, know my disquiet within. So he's taking responsibility. He's inviting the Holy Spirit. These are my anxious thoughts, search me. I want you to do this work in me. He's taking responsibility and refocusing toward the Lord. And so, you know, sometimes I wonder, this is a great prayer to pray because what are we leaving undetected? What are we leaving unchecked? that we're just running with. Then the next verse, 24, he says, and look and see if there is any offensive way in me. Because his grace is always there to forgive. But if there's any offensive way in me, dread creates a way, a neural pathway in our brain, and it just continues to cycle and cycle. So we have to be deliberate about battling it. God is way too good for us to stay anxious and to stay in dread because he is watching over every moment in every stage of our life. You know, we can't always help what feelings come upon us. Feelings come and feelings go, uh, but we can decide where we're going with our thoughts, where we're gonna set our mind, how we're gonna renew our mind. Um, there's always something we could dread. From the moment we wake up, there's always something we could dread. And we certainly don't live pretending there's no problems around us, but faith tells us we have the deciding vote on how something is going to influence us and how we're gonna face life. So the enemy flaunts and exacerbates and exaggerates problems. He multiplies their intensity to get us to dread. And uh, that will, man, that'll take us into hopelessness and powerlessness and fear and dread. It'll just create a whole ecosystem in the way we think. So lurking underneath the surface of dread, I believe there are two lies. One lie is hopelessness. Somehow my future is disabled, it's disturbed, it's debilitated. It's something negative and that can lead me to despair and I'm responsible for that. The second one is powerlessness, a sense I have no empowering, no authority, no ability to deal with currently what's happening or what will happen in the future. And we need to name both of these as lies because scripture is very clear. Romans 15, 13 says he is the God of all hope and he can cause us to abound in hope. And Ephesians 3.16 says we're empowered by the presence of the Holy Spirit at all times. We are never, ever powerless. So when the enemy exaggerates and flaunts our problems and multiplies their intensity, what we can do to disarm him is take up the sword of the Spirit in our hand and fight with the truth. Someone said expectation is the fruit of faith. Where you believe things are gonna go wrong 
you empower destructive outcomes. I like that. I think that's absolutely true because expectation sets us in a certain direction and then we end up there. If left unchecked, you could actually be partnering with inviting a foreboding spirit into your life. And boy, once that spirit gets a grip, you prepare for the worst so you won't be disappointed. And then the worst comes along because you're usually not disappointed because of what you believed. You believed for a negative outcome. And the enemy sows just seeds of doubt and fear and uncertainty and to cripple us. But we have the word, we have the truth, and we have the spirit within us. I love what David said in Psalm 27, verse 3. If an enemy encamps around me, my heart will not fear. If war arises against me, in spite of this, I am confident. I love that. He says, I will not fear. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Whose responsibility is that? mine, yours. Don't fear. Don't let this happen. It's, it's, it's our choice. Um, Philippians 4, he, he has promised to guard our heart and mind. If we will set our mind on what's good and true, he's not going to forsake us. 2 Timothy 1, 7, you know this, God's not given us a spirit of timidity, but power, love, and a sound mind. So dread wants us to, wants to numb us, wants us to avoid uh, and that's not a healthy approach to life. When we start feeling dread, we need to do the very thing we don't want to do, which is to face it, feel it, let it come up, acknowledge it. Lord, I'm suddenly flooded with dread. Put it right in front of you. Let it rise to the surface and name it uh, because that's what God always invites us to do, to come honestly, to come with our true voice, to say, here's what I'm feeling. And here's what I need from you. And I'm ready to make the exchange. Come and meet me in this. Uh, we decide on what impact it's going to have. So I want to close the last few minutes. Uh, I got an email one time from Chris Vallotton of Bethel Church. And he calls it the nine keys to breaking negative beliefs. And I like this, so I'm just going to run through them. One, look for Jesus in the midst of your troubles. He's always hanging out in hard places. Two, Meditate on God's past miracles and works in your life. You know, often in the Old Testament, he would tell them, remember, put a pile of stones here so you can remember. And this is using our imagination and our memory to shift to what's real and good. Three, cultivate thankfulness in your heart, no matter how you feel. Give thanks in everything. Four, avoid the misery loves company syndrome by disciplining yourself to hang around happy people. <laughs> I love people who are fun and who like to laugh. Five, pray in the spirit. Jude 20 says when we pray in the spirit, we're building ourselves up. Six, take a mental vacation every day. So you give yourself permission. I'm just taking a break from thinking about that. I'm giving it to the Lord and I'm going to take a break and cultivate some other kinds of thoughts. Seven, remind yourself these circumstances will not last forever. Every season comes to a close. Eight, don't forget everything works out for good in the end. So if it isn't good, it isn't the end yet. Romans 8, 28. Nine, refuse to partner with any thought that doesn't inspire hope because any thought that doesn't inspire hope is rooted in a lie. So we have the mind of Christ. We don't have to allow the other things. When we give weight to the good things, to the right thing, we can say that just doesn't matter that much and I'm gonna throw it off. Then the 10th is what I've, I've added, I've already mentioned, use the word of God, lift up your sword to fight. No matter how you feel, take the Lord at his word and use it to fight. Guard your heart and mind. Uh, no matter what triggers the anxiety, I can fix my intention in the truth and I can walk in the light and eventually that dread has to lessen more and more and more. It's a process. So I bless you today as you walk through some of these. I hope you'll take hold of them and I'll see you next time.